The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. It's coming. All these voices. They're not yours. You had no right to them when you were alive, and you have no right to them when you're dead. That's what it sounded like. Good, you know who I am. And you know I'm not playing. You're going to let those women go. In Jesus' name, you're going to let those women go. Is there a demon here watching us right now? Watching us right now. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr. And with me as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? Good evening, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your night. It's the 1st of September. It's almost fall, guys. Good evening. Thank you, brother. Tonight's episode is going to be a fun one. This is one that old boy has been wanting to do for quite a while. And he brought up uh, last week or the week before... And so I figured, let's go ahead and get this one done. Um, this is one I can tell you already that we are probably not going to agree on. But that's okay. That's what makes this show awesome, is you got two different uh, points of view on every different subject. So since Old Boy is so stoked about this one, we're going to let him go first again. And then I will be back after he is done. So Old Boy, go ahead, brother. Thank you, brother. And good evening, guys, and thank you for joining us for another awesome show on Staring into the Abyss. Uh, Action-packed another hour for you guys. Just so you know, I am wearing the Staring into the Abyss shirt. If you guys can see it, there's me, there's James. There's a whole different, we have like 30 different shirts, but this is one of them. I wanted to so you guys can actually see what it looks like. It says Staring into the Abyss. It's going to be hard to see. But again, I just wanted to show you that guys it's you can get them at the store um this is one i wanted to do i brought it up last week and it actually became a show um oddities i'm not going to say freaks because that's not the word to use um but we'll start about that um i was talking to james and i told him we should do the show because they were really treated bad um uh, they were taken advantage of because of their deformities and mutations, or they were born with uh, bad deformities of like their hands looked like a crab. There was Tom Thumb; he was very short and small. There was the I think they were uh, the Yang brothers. The the Yang brothers, I think they were. Or they changed their name because back then. Uh, they used people, they wanted to be more proper, Bartram and Bailey, and um, shows like that when they started in, in, I think it was 1887, I think he originally started in 1841 when he was Bartram, and then he made uh, Bailey too, and then he got like, something happened where there was a fire when he was originally starting it, and I know the Ringing Brothers were, I think the starters who did this, they were having little... Uh, tents and they would set up they would go town to town city to city and they have wagons and they would set up their uh tents and they would have these people exploited and that's what happened with most of these people and they, i don't know if you watched american horror story they did freak show and that was it was a horror version of it and they had this clown and it had like this weird looking creepy face and there's a lot of people going around killing each other and you know if you watch that show it was pretty crazy um, but I'm not going to call them freak show cause I'm very, it, it's offensive word now because they're not freaks. Um, it's not their fault. People were born that way or accidents happen and they got disformed or disfigured or born that way. Like Tom Thumb, who was very short and there was the crab boy, they called him, but a, um, the, the lady with three legs. Uh, the gentleman who Fedor, I think he was, uh, had that disease where he grew hair. It looked like the werewolf boy. I remember I read about him where, and he wasn't, he was a man that had like, uh, had that, that there's like a, like, a. it's not a disease, but it's a, it's like a, a, I wouldn't say a mutation. Um, 
It's just his body, he grows out his whole body's fur. So they called him the werewolf boy or whatever. And there's a, they, they've been doing this for years in Mexico. They were calling them werewolf family and they're not. They just have a, a gene where they grow more hair than most people. It's all over their face, their body, their arms, their legs. You know, they'd have hair everywhere, you know, even their face. So they look like a werewolf, but they're not. They were spoiled that way exploitation is very bad and that's what was going on but in the 1800s these people were treated very bad remember there was a lot of racists going around especially in this world at that time in the 1800s so of course there was a lot of bad things going on and these people were taken advantage of sorry if you don't agree with me then that's too bad i don't care um these people were not bad people. They, they didn't have anywhere else to go. They were treated like crap. Just like the Elephant Man. If you guys ever seen that movie, that's that was a true person. Guy was, you know, I know Hollywood made it bigger than it was. but And I'm going to get into the other movie in a couple minutes. But I know that Hollywood really made that, you know. But he was treated bad. And he was deformed. And had was elephant elephant disease or something, and in the movie they had like his mom got trampled by a, a, a elephant, so he was just deformed. But I think he was born with that. I don't know. I got to read the whole story about him. I didn't really get into that. It's another show we could do about the elephant man because it's a very interesting, sad story. Uh, how people took advantage of people like that to make money, and it's no surprise it happens all the time. Even now it happens. I remember there was a show on little uh uh forget what it was oddities or something it was on a uh, mtv for a while i had a friend that was on there um uh, matt mccarthy i haven't seen him in years he used to go to high school but he was on there and um uh you know it was a different thing then i think it was on mtv or vh1 i forget what exactly channel it was on but i used to watch it pretty much they were you know it wasn't as like barlam and bailey where they were living in cages and tents and stuff like that but you know back then things were different than it was now it, people saw things differently people would believe anything they seen even in the middle ages they used to have stuff like this they would just dress up dogs that look like something else they did the same thing all the way up to the 19th century they'll have like a, a three-headed dog and it's really not they have it fake it, there's a lot of fake stuff that was going on and but some of these people just had uh, deformities and they were born with these these bad side effects or they had three fingers or something they would call them some dumb name the kangaroo kid or so, just dumb stuff and it was really pathetic in my opinion and I get it it you know Barnum and Bailey they helped these people because these people would have been either used as slaves bad things or killed so they did help them to a point, but they used them to make money. But you know what? Hey, back then you had to do what you had to do. The wild, wild west was a crazy place. But I'm not defending it or condoning it. Sorry, condoning it. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, So you guys seen the movie in 1932 called Freaks. It's a very controversial movie because they use those people to make money. The Siamese twins, uh, they called the guy Pinhead because I guess he was a... They were born with a... Sh their head looks like it's smaller and they, they, they're mentally challenged, but they called him Pinhead. Crab Boy Tom Thumbs in that movie. Uh, the half man, half woman thing. Um, <clears throat> I think there was the guy called Hercules. He was really strong. And at the end, they go after the the... Uh, the ringleader. I haven't seen the movie in so long, but they called them freaks, but they made them look like monsters. And it was ridiculous because some of these people really were like that. They had deformities or, or, or bad accidents or they were just born different. And people called them freaks and they're not freaks. That irritates me. You know why? I'm going to tell you why. I was picked on really bad when I was a kid. I was really heavy and I got picked on bad. Like, bad. Like, to the point where, like, I hated school. I hated everything. And I know how it feels to be treated differently. And it's really ri ridiculous. So, um, the movie in 1932, Freaks, was, I think, was very controversial because they exploited people that had deformities and were disfigured. Or were born just with diseases and they 
called him crab boy tom they you know all kinds of stuff and like they had them look like they were monsters in the movie they made the Susie, I think the the late they called him the pinhead girl because she was born with that weird she had like a, a smaller head and she was mentally challenged but they 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 made it look real bad um check it out if you guys ever see the movie it was made in like 1932 it was uh it's a very controversial movie and uh i know why just like the elephant man guys like i was saying earlier if you ever seen that movie the movie's really sad how they tortured that guy at first and then uh anthony hawkins sees him and then brings him to the real world his mom was uh trampled by an elephant and he was disfigured i think he was born like that and they called him the elephant man because he was just he he was disformed and uh it was a really sad movie go check it out guys it's pretty it's a pretty good movie oh and like he said he just wanted to be treated right and no one to feel bad for him but it's hard because you see somebody like that and it's like I don't understand how people could take advantage of these people because they had oddity. They called them oddities now. That's what I call them. They they, they even have them now still. Um, they don't call them freaks. I won't call them that. I think that's a very disrespectful name. And I know people use it for movies. And I mean, I know there's a horror movie, uh, Free, Fun House. It was about a uh, kind of like this cow half human creature that was a murdering monster. And that's what they do. They always make them like freaks or weirdos, just like American horror story freak show that show the clown was going around killing people and just it just was ridiculous because it makes them look like they're like that and they're not and people are afraid of them because they look different and i know how that feels because i was a heavy set kid and we got picked on and i had adhd i i have learning disabilities and i was picked on really bad so i know how it feels to be treated differently and it's not fun uh, i'll tell you this right now guys i it, 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 it irritates me not now because they're getting treated right they're doing it on their own they know what's going on you know but the other people in the 18 and 1700s ringling brothers barton and bailey they, and you know they were treated better by them than they were by people that were locking them up in cages and and dragging them around tents and making money off of them they did the same thing but you know check it out see what you guys think remember always leave your comments and what you guys think about the show what shows do you want us to do next like i said check out the shirt i'm wearing it for you guys staring into the abyss i hope you guys like this one i we picked it after last week i kind of brought it up and i always try to do that eventually i want to do like i was saying i want to do the show about the elephant man it would be a very interesting show um one day we'll do it not this next time but it was just a you know we're going to keep getting different shows you know, and that would probably be an interesting one. I think you guys would like it. I think you guys would. Um, again, you know, if you guys want to look up a lot of stuff about oddities and they call them freak shows, but it's a very, uh, it's considered more more of a, hate, a hateful word now. So, you know, you know what to look up, Barnum and Bailey, and see what the acts, they have like a list of all the people like Tom Thumb and I think they call them the Chang brothers. They were Siamese twins. Um, there was the Lion Face Man, the Crab Boy, uh, Fadar. He was that the werewolf, you know, the werewolf disease. It, you know, he grew hair everywhere, and it's actually a you know just a a gene that makes you grow hair everywhere. And, and you know, I saw the the, the werewolf people from Mexico. <laughs> Same thing. They just they're regular people. They just have. A gene that makes them grow a lot of hair everywhere their face their body you know like we were talking about earlier um nothing wrong with that these people are not bad people they were just taken advantage of tom thumb was very known back then he was very small and they would have him sing songs and make money off of him and that's what they do back then in the day to make a lot of money and these people would get little of it or they would pay him just a place to stay and a little bit of cash it was like being in paradise because they got treated like crap everywhere else so they were taken advantage of explored it and it happens and it's sad that it had to be like that but you know what it's better than what could have been going on at the time but i'm not advocating it was a better life it's sad what happened
that people are that ignorant and treat people like this and make money off of anybody. And like I said, that's why I don't want Bigfoot found, Jersey Devil, Loch Ness Monster, because this is what will happen. People will take advantage of it, lock them up in cages, and after 10, 15 years, you'll get tired of seeing them and something else will come along and you'll want to see that. And they'll be locked away in giant aquariums where they're not supposed to be. They're not in their own habitat. But at least they'll be safe to a point. But some of these places, there's always iffies of people treating them bad. And that's the problem. And that's what I would always be worried about. Are these creatures going to be treated like crap? Are they going to be treated bad? Are people going to uh, abuse them? And that's what you always have to worry about, especially with, you know, you know, the oddity people. Uh, I call them regular people that had, you know, handicap. And that's not a bad way to, t like, don't call them freaks because that's, that's disrespectful in my opinion. And it even says that, they, like, they don't even want, that's, that, that's that's no honor to that. They weren't freaks. They were just different. And that's not a bad thing. They were better than most normal people. No one's really normal. But normal, no, dis, dif, dysfunctions or, you know, no um, in deformities or diseases. But these people were taken advantage of. That's all I got to say, guys. I hope you guys like the show. Go ahead, James. There you go. That's all I got to say. I hope you guys liked it and let us know what you think in the comments. Thank you, brother. That's pretty much what I figured he was going to say. Uh, we've had discussions about this before, and I know his viewpoint on it. So let me give you mine. Um, I do not believe that freak shows are exploitation of deformed people. I just don't believe it because... I've done a lot of research on this, and I've seen the evidence. And also, I have some experience with the carny lifestyle. Because when I was a, a teenager in high school and right out of high school, I worked for carnivals uh, some. Not a, not a ton, but some. Enough to, to get to know the people and to kind of hang out with them and to have a pretty good understanding of that world. And I say that world because it is an entirely different world than the one that we live in. And that's just the truth of it. Um, carnies are looked upon as dirty and, and disgusting by some people. Carnies are looked at as people that are not of the highest moral fiber. But that's because carnies are misunderstood. They may not go along with society. They may not play by your rules, but they do have a code of honor. And among their own, they are very, very loyal and very loving and very kind. They look out for each other. That's the bottom line. And so to insinuate that, that these people who joined freak shows were somehow being exploited or harmed by the Carney family is, is just not true. I know that's the popular narrative that, that everybody says today. And the problem is people try to view history through the lens of today. And you can't do that because it was a different time. They were different people. Today's climate is one of political correctness and I'll just say it, downright communism. That's what it is. If you look at the tenets of communism, it's exactly what they do, is what is happening in our country today. They want to make it so that you can't speak the truth. They want to make it so that you can't say things. You don't have that freedom of speech that we all used to treasure. Because that way you can't criticize the insane crap that they're doing all the time. The truth of this is that nobody was ever forced into a freak show. They didn't go to these people's houses and snatch them out of their beds and put them in a cage and ride them around the country and poke, poke them with sticks and all that kind of stuff. Didn't happen. These people 
many of them had no other way to make a living. And if it wasn't for the freak shows, they would have been destitute. They would have been homeless and dead at a very early age. The freak shows gave them not just an opportunity, but a career. It gave them a chance to live their life and to have a good life. And when I say a good life, I mean a better life than most of us have today. And I'm going to give some examples of this. I'm not just talking out my butt. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time during this episode giving you proof. I'm going to go through some examples, some people that were extraordinarily famous in the freak show world and extraordinarily successful in the freak show world. So without further ado, I think that's what I'm going to do. And I think the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to, I'm going to put their faces on the screen. I want you to see pictures of these people because I want you to understand and to realize that these weren't victims. These weren't mindless robotic freaks. These were people. They were deformed, some of them. Uh, some of them were not really deformed, but they were just gigantic or tiny. Or in one case, the dude had like over 300 and some tattoos. So they weren't, they weren't monsters. They were people. And they were people that chose this life. They chose to go to the, to the freak shows and to be exhibits. In many cases, they, they asked many times, please let me come to work here because it was the only way they could make a living. And they made a hell of a living, some of them. And that's what I'm going to prove. So without further ado, I'm going to put, as each person I'm talking about, I'm going to put them on the screen so you can look at them. I'm sure you don't want to look at me sitting here reading notes. You know what I mean? Because I took a lot of notes on this. I did a lot of research. Um, and it's just way too much for the old noggin to remember every little bit of it because I'm getting old. So I took me some notes. So instead of you sitting there watching me read from a spiral notebook, I'm going to put their faces on the screen so that you can see who we're talking about. So without further ado, let's do that now. We're going to start with one of the most famous of all of the freak show performers, the oddity performers. And that would be Tom Thumb. Now, Tom Thumb's real name was Charles Sherwood Stratton. And he was a dwarf. And he was billed as General Tom Thumb. Uh, at the time when he started, he was four years of age, but they claimed that he was 11. Now, Charles had stopped growing after the first six months of his life. And at that point, he was 25 inches tall and weighed 15 pounds. With a hell of a lot of coaching and, and natural talent, he was taught to imitate people from Hercules to Napoleon. By five, he was drinking wine, and by seven, he was smoking cigars for the public's amusement. During 1844 to 1845, Barnum toured with Tom Thumb in Europe, and he met Queen Victoria, who was amused and saddened by the little man. And the event was an absolute publicity coup for Barnum. Now, this is the part that I want to stress because... As Old Boy was saying earlier, these people were taken advantage of and treated poorly and all this kind of stuff. Barnum paid Stratton very, very well. He made $150 a week. Now, this is back in 1844. That is a hell of a lot of money back in 1844. He made so much money that when Stratton retired, he lived in the best neighborhood of New York. He owned a yacht and he dressed in the finest clothing that money could buy. So here we have a, a guy that is a tiny little dude, 25 inches tall, and he's able to become rich, not just rich, but like yacht rich. Okay. This isn't, well, maybe I won't have to work anymore and I can afford to take my wife out to dinner every day if I want. This is yacht rich. Okay. This dude made a hell of a lot of money. So he doesn't look very exploited or very uh, hurt by any of this, in my opinion. I mean, he made a hell of a lot of money. He had a great life, a lot better life than he would have had had he not been on the freak show circuit. 
The next one we're going to talk about is Zip the Pinhead. Now, Zip the Pinhead is one that probably most people will recognize, and they did like a version of him on the American Horror Stories thing. Zip's early performances uh, had a background story. They told the audience that a tribe of missing links had been discovered in Africa, and that, that was what Zip was, was one of these missing links. It was also explained that the wild man, the what is it, lived completely on raw meat, nuts, and fruit. But he was learning to eat more civilized foods, such as bread and cake. They would bring Zip out in a cage where he would rattle the bars and scream all crazy like an animal. Now, this wasn't exploitation. This wasn't being cruel. They didn't keep him in a cage all the time. He was simply in a cage for the performance. And the act was tremendously successful for Barnum and for Zip. Because Zip was a big attraction in the Barnum American Museum. He was just as famous as the Siamese twins, a Chang, and Ing Bunker, uh, pretty much almost as famous as Tom Thumb. He was a big deal. And in his later years, Zip became more civilized in his act. He got out of the cage, he stopped doing that shtick, and he actually came on stage with a lot of the other oddities. Uh, he got to share the stage with his friend, the uh, Texas giant Jim Tarver. He was billed as the tallest man in the world. Jack Earl and Cuckoo the Bird Girl. Uh, he traveled all over the world with the Ringling Brothers Circus. And he had a, a fairly good life. In 1860, he was visited at the museum by Albert Edward, who was the Prince of Wales. And his photo was actually taken by Civil War photographer Matthew Brady. So throughout this period, Zip's best friend and manager was Captain O.K. White. And White looked after Zip's interest. He looked after his business interest, and he looked after his personal interest. He was so fond of Zip that he even gave Zip his most prized possession in the world, which was a tuxedo. In his later years, Zip decided he didn't want to travel anymore. So he just kind of hung out at Coney Island and performed there. And one Sunday afternoon in 1925, Zip heard a little girl crying for help. And he looked around and he noticed that there was a little girl waving her arms in the ocean, that she was drowning. So he jumped in and swam out and rescued her. Um, in early 1926, he caught bronchitis. And his doctor and Captain White, his manager, wanted him to take it easy, to rest and to get better. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to stay on stage because he loved it. So he continued to perform his part in a stage play um, called Sonny at the uh, New Amsterdam Theater. Upon the closing of the play, he went back to his home in Bound Brook, New Jersey, where he was under the care of his doctor, uh, Captain White, and his sister also. Uh, he, it was a little bit too late at that point. His condition worsened. And he was moved to Bellevue Hospital in New York City, and that's where he died. It is estimated that during his 67 years in show business, Zip entertained more than 100 million people. That is amazing. 100 million people. Zip the Pinhead was buried in Plot 399 of the Bound Brook Cemetery on April 28, 1926. A small gravestone bearing the inscription, William H. Johnson, 1957 to 1926, marks his final resting place. Now, I want you to notice what I said there. During his 67 years in show business, that's what this was, guys. None of these quote unquote freaks were held against their will. They weren't snatched up out of their, out of their homes and, and forced to, to perform. I mean, these people sought out the freak show because they didn't have any way to make a living. A lot of people couldn't get jobs when they were all disfigured and messed up like that. So they would go to these places and they would ask to be part of the freak show. They would ask to be an exhibit. And they would be paid very well and they'd be taken care of. I mean, like I said earlier on, people that don't understand the carny life, they don't have any experience with it, they don't know what that's like. It's not that these people are made fun of or treated horribly. They were family, man. Carnies stick together. It's all one big family. 
yes, it's sometimes a very dysfunctional family. And sometimes they're not the greatest people because they, they can do kind of sketchy things sometimes. But to each other, they're very loyal. And they're very kind. So this wasn't exploitation, I don't think. This was giving these people an opportunity to make a great living. A far better living than they would have had had they not joined up with the freak show. And they were treated with love and respect. A lot of the stuff that you saw on the stage was just that. Stuff for the stage. It was a show. It wasn't reality. They didn't keep these people in cages. The next one I want to talk about is Anna Swan. Now, Anna Swan was born at Millbrook, New Anna, Nova Scotia. And at birth, she weighed 16 pounds. She was the third of 13 children. All the others were around average height. Uh, from birth, she grew very, very rapidly. On her fourth birthday, she was four feet, six inches. Four years old, four feet, six inches tall. And she weighed 94 pounds. On her sixth birthday, she measured at five feet, two inches. And she was an inch or two shorter than her mother at that point. And that's on her sixth birthday. On her 10th birthday, she measured six foot one inch tall. And on her 12th birthday, she was six five. So she was my size on her 12th birthday. By her 15th birthday, she was seven feet tall. She reached her full height three years later. Her feet measured 14.2 inches long. She excelled at literature and music and was considered to be very, very intelligent. She also excelled at her studies of acting, piano, and voice. She played Lady Macbeth in a play, and on July 13, 1865, she nearly burned to death when the Barnum's Museum was destroyed by fire. The stairs were engulfed in flames, and unfortunately, she was too large to escape through the window. And at that time, she weighed 384 pounds, when she usually weighed in around 350, uh, but at that point, she was 384, and her highest recorded weight ever was 392. Luckily, as I said before, Carney stick together. Some of them came in through the fire and helped her escape. When visiting a circus in Halifax, in which uh, Martin Van Buren Bates, another enormously tall person, was traveling, Swan was spotted by the promoter and hired on the spot. The giant couple became a touring sensation and eventually fell in love. They married on June 17, 1871 in St. Martin in the Fields in London. In 1872, Bates and her husband purchased 130 acres of land and had furniture made to their specifications. Martin supervised the construction of the house, and the main part of the house had 14-foot-tall ceilings, while the doors were extra wide and were 8 feet tall. The back part of the house was built an average size for servants and guests. So this woman, who was a giant, Okay, she was seven feet tall, but she was very intelligent and she was great at acting and piano and voice. And she was very, very smart. So she could have had a career anywhere she chose. She chose to get on the freak show circuit. And she was so successful and made so much money that her husband and her were able to purchase 130 acres of land. And not only purchase the land. But they were able to build a custom house that was made special with special tall ceilings and doors that are extra wide and tall and construct all furniture that was large enough for them. So all of that stuff is custom work. All that stuff is extra money. And they were able to afford to do all of that on what they made on the free show circuit. Once again, does not seem like exploitation to me. Seems like a great career. Bates conceived two children with Martin. The first was a girl born on May 19, 1872. She weighed 18 pounds and died at birth. While touring in the summer of 1878, Anna was pregnant for the second time. The boy was born on January 18, 1879. That's my wife's birthday, January 18th, and survived only 11 hours. He was the largest newborn ever recorded at 23 pounds, 9 ounces. Wow, he was nearly 30 inches tall. Could you imagine trying to give birth to a 23-pound, 9-ounce baby that is 30 inches tall? 
goodness gracious. I mean, she's seven foot tall, but I'm sure that she's not that much bigger in the womb area than most women. So imagine that, 23 pounds, 9 ounces, 30 inches tall. She's lucky she didn't die. Each of his feet was 6 inches long. For this, he was awarded a Guinness Book of World Record after his death. The Bates resumed touring with the W.W. Cole Circus in the summer of 1879 and again in the spring of 1880. Bates spent her remaining years quietly on the farm that she and her husband owned. She had joined the local Baptist church in 1877 and attended services with her husband. Bates died suddenly and unexpectedly of heart failure in her sleep at her home on August 5, 1888, one day before her 42nd birthday. The cause of her height was never discovered in her lifetime. X-rays were not discovered until 1895, so it could not be ascertained if she had a pituitary tumor. The next gentleman I want to talk about is Commodore Nutt. George Washington Morrison Nutt was born April 1, 1848, and he died May 25, 1881. He was better known by his stage name, Commodore Nutt. He was an American dwarf and an entertainer that was associated with the P.T. Barnum Museum and Circus. In 1861, Nutt was touring New England with a circus when Barnum hired him to appear at the American Museum in New York City. Barnum gave Nutt the stage name Commodore Nutt, a wardrobe that included naval uniforms and a miniature carriage in the shape of an English walnut. Nutt became one of the museum's major attractions. Nutt was in love with Lavinia Warren, another dwarf at the American Museum. Lavinia was several years older than Nutt. She thought of him only as a nice little boy. She actually married General Tom Thumb in a spectacular wedding masterminded by Barnum in 1863. Nutt went to the wedding as Tom Thumb's best man, but resented his place in the show. He stayed away from women for a long time after the wedding. In 1879, he married Lillian Elston of Redwood City, California. Nutt toured the world between 1869 and 1872 with the Thumbs and Minnie Warren, Lavinia's sister. They returned to America rich beyond their dreams after appearing before royalty around the world. Nutt left Barnum's employ after a disagreement with the showman. He toured with a comic opera company, put together a variety show on the United States West Coast, and operated Western saloons in Oregon and California. He returned to New York City and died there of Bright's disease in May of 1881. So here's another person, rich beyond his wildest dreams because of his work in the show business of freak shows. And notice that I said he left Barnum's employ. So he quit. He looked at P.T. Barnum and said, hey, screw you, dude, I'm out. They got an argument, he, he bailed. Wasn't held against his will. He was a willing participant. He made a hell of a lot of money, and when he felt he wasn't treated properly, or he felt that, that there was a disagreement there, he left. The next one I want to talk about is Captain Constantinus. Now, Barnum's most popular and arguably the highest grossing act of all time was the tattooed man, George Constantinus. He claimed to be a Greek Albanian prince raised in a Turkish harem. He had 338 tattoos covering his body. Each one was ornate and told a story. His story was that he was on a military expedition, but was captured by native people who gave him the choice of either being chopped up into little pieces or receive full body tattoos. This process supposedly took three months and Constantinus was the only hostage who survived. He produced a 23 page book, which detailed every aspect of his experience and drew a large crowd. When he partnered with Barnum, he began to earn more than a thousand dollars a week. This is in the 1800s. His wealth became so staggering that the New York Times wrote, quote, He wears very handsome diamond rings and other jewelry, valued altogether at about $3,000. Now that's like almost 75 grand in today's money. So he's walking around with 75 G's of jewelry on and usually goes armed to protect himself from persons who might attempt to rob him. Though Constantinus was fortunate, 
Other freaks were not. Upon his death in 1891, he donated about half of his life earnings to other freaks who did not make as much money as he did. Now, I want to stress here that you have failures and successes in every business. In show business, you have actors who are crazy successful, like, like a Tom Cruise, Tom Hanks, those kind of people. And then you have people who go out to California to try to be an actor, end up working as a waitress, end up booked on drugs and homeless. It happens in show business, period. The fact that some of these freak show performers didn't do as well as some of the other ones is not a, a black mark on freak shows. It's just the nature of show business. It's the way it works. Some people succeed, some people don't. Uh, but this was a good dude, man. He, he gave half of his, his life earnings to help out other performers who didn't make as much money as he did. The next one I want to talk about is an interesting one. Uh, this is Frank Lentini. You might know him better as, as the Three-Legged Man. Lentini was born at 8 Genitoli Street, Rosalini, Sicily, on May 18, 1889. He was delivered by midwife Maria Alberino, and he was the fifth of 12 children. He had seven sisters and five brothers in his family. Uh, disgraced initially, his parents gave him into the care of the wife of his uncle, Carito Falco. At four months old, he was sent to be examined by a specialist in Naples. Uh, by age five, he was playing with other children and was able to straighten his third leg, but he could not walk yet. He became known for having three legs, four feet, and two sets of genitals. Lentini was born with a parasitic twin. The twin was attached to his body at the base of his spine and consisted of a pelvic bone, a rudimentary set of male genitalia, and a full-size leg extending from the right side of his hip with a small foot that protruded from its knee. He was exhibited in numerous cities throughout the world, including London, in 1897. When he was eight, Magnano, who ran a traveling puppet show, brought him to Middletown and Lentini's family moved to the United States. Lentini then entered the sideshow business as the Great Lentini, joining the Wriggling Brothers Circus. He gained U.S. citizenship at age of 30, and his career spanned over 40 years, and he worked with every major circus and sideshow including Barnum and Bailey's and Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show. Lentini was so respected among his peers that he was often called the king. In his youth, Lentini used his third leg to kick a football across the stage, hence his show name, the three-legged football player. Lentini's normal legs were slightly different in length. One was 39 inches and the other 38 inches, which isn't that big of a difference. The third leg was only 36 inches and ended in a club foot. As an adult, his primary legs remained of different lengths, while his extra leg was several inches shorter. He complained that even with three legs, he still did not have a pair. In 1907, he married Teresa Murray, who was three years younger than him, and they had four children, Josephine, Ned, Frank, and James. When Frank and Teresa separated around 1935, he began a new life with Helen Shoup, with whom he lived until his death. Lentini died of lung failure in Jackson, Tennessee on September 21st, 1966, at the age of 77. Here's another gentleman who had a great career. Chang and Ng Bunker. These are also among the most famous of freak show performers. Chang Bunker and Ng Bunker uh, were born May 11, 1811, and they died January 17, 1874. They were Siamese-American conjoined twin brothers, whose fame propelled the expression of Siamese twins. So that's where the whole Siamese twin thing comes from. They're actually conjoined twins, but we call them Siamese twins in honor of these two gentlemen, because they were so awesome. They were widely exhibited as curiosities and were two of the 19th century's most studied human beings. The brothers were born with Chinese ancestry in Siam, now known as Thailand, and were brought to the United States in 1829. Physicians inspected them as they became known to American and European audiences in freak shows. Newspapers and the public were initially sympathetic to them, and within three years they left the control of their managers, who they thought were cheating them, 
and toured on their own. In early exhibitions, they appeared exotic and displayed their athleticism. They later held conversation in English in a more dignified parlor setting. In 1839, after a decade of financial success, the twins quit touring and settled near Mount Airy, North Carolina. They became American citizens, they bought slaves, married local sisters, and fathered 21 children, several of whom accompanied them when they resumed touring. Chang and Ng's respective families lived in separate houses, where the twins took alternating three-day stays. After the Civil War, they lost part of their wealth and their slaves. Ng died hours after Chang at the age of 62. An autopsy revealed that their livers were fused in the ligament connecting their sternums. So here you have another, another sideshow attraction, another freak show star that became very, very wealthy to the point where they could buy a plantation and buy slaves. That's a lot of money. They did very well for themselves. Now we're going to talk about probably the most famous and in some ways the most tragic freak show attraction of all time, and that is Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man. Joseph Carey Merrick was born August 5, 1862, and he died April 11, 1890. He was often uh, mistakenly called John Merrick, but his name was actually Joseph Carey Merrick. And he was an Englishman uh, known for having severe deformities. He was first exhibited at a freak show under the stage name The Elephant Man, and then went to live at the London Hospital after he met Sir Frederick Treves, subsequently becoming well-known in London society. Merrick was born in Leicester and began to develop abnormally before the age of five. His mother died when he was 11, and his father soon remarried. Rejected by his father and his stepmother, he left home and went to live with his uncle Charles Merrick. In 1879, 17-year-old Merrick entered the Leicester Union Workhouse. In 1884, he contacted a showman named Sam Tor and proposed that Tor should exhibit him. Tor arranged for a group of men to manage Merrick, whom they named the Elephant Man. After touring the East Midlands, uh, Merrick traveled to London to be exhibited in a penny gaff shop rented by showman Tom Norman. Norman's shop was visited by Surgeon Frederick Traves, who invited Merrick to be examined. After Merrick was displayed by Trebs at a meeting of the Pathological Society of London in 1883, Norman's shop was closed by the police, and Merrick joined Sam Roper's circus and toured in Europe. In Belgium, Merrick was robbed by his road manager and abandoned in Brussels. He eventually made his way back to the London hospital, where he was allowed to stay for the rest of his life. Trebs visited him daily, and the pair developed a close friendship. Merrick also received visits from the wealthy ladies and gentlemen of London society, including Alexandra, Princess of Wales. Although the official cause of his death was asphyxia, Traves, who performed the postmortem, said Merrick had died of a dislocated neck. The exact cause of Merrick's deformities is unclear. In 1986, it was conjectured that he had Proteus syndrome. DNA tests on his hair and bones in a 2003 study were inconclusive because his skeleton had been bleached multiple times before being displayed at the Royal London Hospital. After that, some of his flesh was saved and used for medical study. Okay, so as you can see, these people weren't being exploited in any way, really. Well, let me take that back. I've said many times on Staring here that I'm always going to tell you the truth. And I don't think that's a true statement that they were not exploited in any way. They were exploited in the same way that every actor and actress is exploited today. In the same way that every musician is exploited today. In the same way as every stage performer is exploited today. Because the bottom line here, guys, is this was show business. A lot of what people look back in the past and, and think, oh, it's so terrible, they were in cages and and they called them bad names and they, all this kind of stuff. You got to realize, man, that, that's show business, man. It's a show. It wasn't real. Take take uh, Zip the Pinhead, for example. That dude came out in a cage, shaking the bars and growling, ah, like he was King Kong or something. 
Now, do you think that he actually was like that? Or do you think that just maybe he was a showman? He was in a show, and he was putting on a show for the crowd to be successful to make more money. I mean, the proof is in the pudding, man. Later on in his career, he didn't do that anymore because he had already had a big name. So he would go and just sit down on a chair and chill out and talk to him, have conversations with people. So he wasn't some crazy wild man. They didn't keep him in a cage nonstop. I think sometimes people don't know how to distinguish between reality and the show. And that's why you have this narrative that that is very popular nowadays that somehow it's offensive or it's cruel to these people. Man, I'll tell you what's cruel. What's cruel is shutting down them damn freak shows. That's what was cruel. Because what you did was you took the livelihood away from a lot of people that really had no way to make that kind of money anywhere else. Now imagine if you were 25 inches tall or you're deformed like the elephant man. You're not going down to Target or Walmart and getting a job, stocking shelves or, or ringing up the public. They're not going to hire you. You can say, oh, there's federal laws. They, they have to hire you. It, it's discrimination. It doesn't matter, man. They, they can use any excuse they want not to hire you. They're not going to say we're not going to hire you because you look like a monstrosity, but that's what it is. They're going to pretend it's some other reason. You weren't qualified enough or they found a better qualified candidate or whatever. But they're not going to put you on the front line of a restaurant because they don't want the customers looking at you and not one to eat. They don't want to put you in front of the customers in like Walmart or something because they don't want little kids to get scared and run away. They don't want to scare the customers. Now, whether or not you would actually scare the customers or whatever, that's, that doesn't even matter. It's just the perception that they, that they would have. And I know that's true because they don't put people on those positions that have a ton of piercings and tattoos and stuff. It's starting to get a little a little less nowadays than it used to be. But for my entire life, man, if you had a bunch of tattoos, especially like visible tattoos and piercings and stuff, you, you couldn't get a job most places. You're going to be stuck working some crap job. You're definitely not going to get a job making enough money to support your family. So how are these people supposed to make a living? They shut all this stuff down. They said, oh, it's terrible what, what they're doing to these people. They're exploiting them. But all you did was cost these people a living. Did anybody ever stop to ask, hey, are you guys happy doing this or do you feel exploited? Because I bet most of them were like, hey, what are you doing? We're trying to make a living here. This is a show, man. You're killing me. Look what happens to people nowadays. If you get somebody nowadays that's deformed and all jacked up like that, they can't go into a freak show. They can't go and, and make money like that. What happens to them? They're a burden on their family. They're a burden on society. They end up in a, in a hospital or a home somewhere or homeless on the street or dead at an early age when people get tired of taking care of them. And you might say, well, that's mean to say that. Well, I don't mean nothing mean by it. That's just the truth. You took away the dignity that these people had in work. Look at the money the tattooed man made. He was walking around with 75 G's worth of jewelry on him. Do you walk around with 75 G's worth of jewelry on you? I sure as hell don't. Look at Tom Thumb, man. He had a yacht. You got a yacht? I ain't got a yacht. I've done pretty damn good in my life. I'm not destitute. I'm not... I'm not some broke loser, but I ain't got no yacht. Tom Thumb had a yacht. What would Tom Thumb have nowadays? His little tiny self would, would be working at McDonald's if he's lucky. Some place like that, because he couldn't get no real good career. Not like he had. 
You can say, well, he might be an actor or something. Okay. How many very, very small actors like that do you know of? How many dwarf actors? One. No, two. I'll give you two. You got the guy from Game of Thrones who's awesome. I love that dude. Hell of an actor. I can't remember his name. And that sucks because I really like that dude. Nope, it's gone. I can't remember it. But he's amazing. Amazing actor. And then you got the dude that played Willow and played Leprechaun. That's it. That's all I can think of. Can you all think of anybody else? Leave it in the comment section if you can, because I can't. There's not that many opportunities for him, man. So I disagree. I disagree vehemently with old boy on this. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying freak show. I don't think there's anything wrong with freak shows. I think that we were wrong in getting rid of them as a society. I think that we should have left them alone and let them do their thing and make money. They weren't hurting nobody. And they weren't being hurt. I mean, the overwhelming majority of them were, were perfectly happy. They were doing good for themselves. And we screwed it all up. So with that being said, I'm going to throw it back over to Old Boy and get his shout-outs, and then we will wrap up. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Staring into the Abyss. Um, it was something different, kind of controversial. So I hope you guys liked it. Like I said, always leave stuff in the comments about what you guys want us to talk about or the show and how you feel. Uh, you guys want to listen to all our shows on Staring into the Abyss, either Parax Radio, Sunday nights at 9 Pacific, 12 Eastern, and the best of on Tuesday nights, 5 Pacific, 8 Eastern, Parax Radio. Or subscribe to James Hershey's YouTube page and you can watch it all and listen to all the new shows. You can see us now on my fabulous beard because a lot of people are tripping out because they all old boys changed. Not really. I'm just getting older, guys. You know, I wanted to grow a beard and I like it. So, um, you guys want merchandise, he'll tell you to go where to go. I think it's staring into the abyss, teespring.com. If I'm wrong, he will, he will fix it. Um, you can get shirts, COVID masks, all kinds of cool stuff. So, I hope you guys had a good uh, evening. I hope you guys are getting ready for the holidays or coming around the corner. So, just remember that, guys. We love you. Misfits, sugar ladies, monster lovers, demon hunters, I love you. And blessed be and have a great night. Mr. Thank you, brother. I want to thank everybody for tuning in this week. I appreciate you guys, as always. Um, the YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. That's where everything is. The link to the merchandise store is in the description of every single video. So if you want merch, that's where you can get it. Um, also, we are now, we have a channel on Stream TV. Uh, I'll be putting the link to that in the description box of this video as well. Uh, that is another place where you can go and actually stream every episode of Tales and Staring. So if you want to check that out, it's 100% free and it's pretty awesome. So check it out. Thank you all again for hanging out with us this week. We love you. We appreciate you. And as always, it's up to you to make up your own mind. Let me know down in the comment section what you think. Until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you. And so do we. Bye-bye.